I'm Ron Toller, and this is Brothers and Sisters Like These. Take a moment to tell you a little bit about us. This program was started by Dr. Bruce Kelly, a primary care physician at the Charles George VA Hospital in Asheville, and Joseph Bathante, the former poet laureate of North Carolina and an English professor at Appalachian State University. From that, beginning in the basement of the Charles George G VA, uh, we have expanded and done a number of classes, including veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as Vietnam. We have formed a legacy group known as brothers and sisters like these and formerly known as the North Carolina Veterans Writing Alliance Foundation. And we continue to write and do weekly meetings, sharing your stories and brotherhood for uh, brother and sisterhood for all of us as we have Lady, lady veterans involved in the group now also. I'll turn it over to our first reader and we'll go from there. First reader would be Alan Perkel. Good evening. I'd like to read a piece uh, that focuses in on meaning and purpose. Vietnam 1967 and 68, taking care of the battle wounded had meaning and purpose to me and those I took care of. Next duty station, stateside, 1968, proved to be the beginning of a bad trip. Do as you're told. I don't care about you in Vietnam. Dis Discharge from the military, October 68, was a wake up call. Blame the warrior for the war. The future for a moment was going to Ohio State. Use the GI Bill to make a new life for yourself. Problem protesters on campus against the war and calling us all sorts of names. So the journey home wasn't a welcome nor an appreciation. Shut up and go on your way. It don't mean nothing. Good luck. Put Vietnam on a shelf, forget about it. Who knew the war would send me on a five-year journey to find myself and somehow find meaning and purpose in my life again. 1974, dazed and confused, depressed, homeless, a lightning bolt hit. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Have you forgotten who you are? A Vietnam veteran. I've never looked back from that day truly coming home. The medic, the caretaker that started in Nam, what was to continue in civilian life as a PTSD therapist for the VA, dedicated to care for the psychological wounds of those who served in war. Now, as I approach the twilight of my life, after 14 years of retirement, I find myself back in the trenches with those who have served their country in a group dutifully named brothers and sisters like these. 50 plus years ago, as a 20 year old non-medic, who knew that defining moment would be the anchor that helped me define meaning and purpose throughout the years. You ask what that is. Dedicated to the mission 
of making a difference in the lives of those who have their country, who serve their country in war. A human being who believes in a cause greater than myself. And, and the epitaph on my gravestone. Here lies a passionate person who met his maker knowing I did my best to make a difference in the world. Together then, together again. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And now we'll hear from John Hoffman. Thank you, Stephen. My, uh, my short piece is entitled A Veteran's Shared Experience. Combat duty in the Republic of South Vietnam was both an isolating experience and an intimately shared one at the same time. As a, fight, as a soldier fighting in that war, you are isolated and remote from the real world back home. Unlike our soldiers in combat today, any form of near real-time communication with those of us South Vietnam to our families and friends back in the States was extremely limited. When such communication was possible, it was anything but intimate and sharing. It was usually via a short wave system. It was very short, very impersonal, and provided no real communication of emotion or relationship. The sense of distance and disconnection was further amplified by the time required for written or recorded communication. On the other hand, you're both distant and close to your fellow soldiers. While it seems surreal to imagine, remaining distant but sharing closely the intimate experiences, this is the reality of combat. The shared experience of combat at the emotional level pushes one to maintain an emotional distance that helps defend yourself from the loss of close friends when that happened. Yet it also brings a connection to your fellow soldiers that results from those very experiences and losses that few outside the military or perhaps the emergency response community can ever fully appreciate, much less know. By late 1972, news reporting of the war that we saw on the one armed forces TV station occasionally available to us while in Vietnam was just as seemingly incorrect and off balance as from the senior leadership and command decisions that impacted us intimately every day while in Vietnam. This further enhanced that sense of isolation from reality and common sense at the emotional level, even if we were senior enough to know the command logic being applied in some cases. Coming back from a dangerous and costly mission where we lost members of our unit, suffered wounds, physical and emotional, only to be told that no US forces were engaged in the operation further fed that internal mental conflict. Soon just surviving and getting home was your focus. And the reality of what you did and experienced each day was, com was quickly compartmentalized and stored away as you focused on that freedom bird at the end of your tour. In my own case, the presence of my father, a United States Air Force Colonel in Vietnam at the same time I was there flying US Army helicopters brought a further twist that, to that unique experience on both the emotional and intellectual levels. We shared that core sense of fear for each other's safety, but at the same time, we did not want to burden each other with worry about our operational activities. Though I would have to admit I was in closer proximity to combat risk than my father was in his office in Zygon. But this led to an ex a relationship during the war and for the rest of our lives that is quite different and far closer than his relationship with my siblings. That shared period of isolation and core level feel and close contact fundamentally changed our father-son communication and perspective on nearly all things. Interesting, I found that after my service in Vietnam, I found a deep-rooted reluctance to engage with others aside from my father on the unpleasant or emotionally sensitive components of that experience. Reality, that is the same dichotomy of relationship that we experienced in Vietnam exists within us long after our return to the real world. This was exacerbated by the treatment and reception most of us experienced outside of the military upon our return. We were reviled and ridiculed publicly by politicians, the media, even Hollywood, where the returning Vietnam helicopter pilot was portrayed as a nut job of some kind. I even found that revealing your background as a Vietnam veteran was something you should not do in the course of day-to-day -day business and commercial activities. 
I was once told by a banker at Wachovia Bank I shouldn't reveal that I was a Vietnam veteran or I would not be approved for a car loan. After Vietnam, close relationships remain difficult for many of us to establish. Our circle of true friends, not colleagues or neighbors, but truly close friends remain small. But at some point for each of us comes what I call the close encounter. That's when you run into or meet up with someone who shared that experience with you in Vietnam. Suddenly you're young again, man or woman in Southeast Asia, and you can talk about your time and experience there in a way you cannot and will not with anyone who is not there. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was very good. At this time I'd ask Midge Lawrence if she would read her piece. Good evening. My name is Midge Lawrence. I am not a veteran, but the widow of one. My husband, Tom, passed away in March of 2019. He was a member of this group of brothers and sisters like these. He was diagnosed with PTSD and depression, and by joining this group and writing out his stories, it helped him tremendously. After he passed away, this wonderful group asked me to join and to write my own stories. Tonight, I'd like to share one with you that is very close to my heart and personal. It's called The Pillowcase. After Tom passed away, there was an immense range of emotions that I felt. I was hurting physically and mentally. I was having dreams, the most vivid being following his body bag which was an American flag out of the hospice unit while taps were being played. His nurses stood in the hallway as I continued to follow him out to the waiting car that would take him for cremation. I had this same dream so many nights. I felt so vulnerable, lonely, and lost. How I missed him. I missed being held I missed feeling his breath on my neck and his soothing hand rubbing my back, telling me everything was okay and not to worry. I slept in our king size bed and sometimes felt like the tiniest fish lost in this big sea of foam. There was no longer anyone to reach for or to have talks with before sleep. There was no one to kiss good night, wish sweet dreams and say, I love you. The only things I had left were beautiful memories and his pillow that he had taken into hospice, which I treasured and slept with every night. It had been about six months since he passed away. I had never removed his pillowcase. I know it sounds totally disgusting, but I just wasn't ready to do it, not yet. In my mind, it just seemed to keep him there with me just a bit longer as time went on. I began to look at that pillowcase almost as symbolic and felt and knew in my mind that it was time. I knew that in order to start my healing process, I would have to let go of his pillowcase. I would always have our memories and special moments tucked away in my heart forever. I arose early the next morning, took his pillow from our bed, hugged it tight, and while tears rolled gently down my face, I delicately removed his pillowcase. As hard as that was, I knew it was now time for me to move to the next phase of my life, which God had already planned out, and I would gladly accept. The end. Thank you. Thank you, Midge. What a touching story. At this time, I will read a piece. I'm Steve Henderson, uh, India Company 3-4, 3rd Marine Division, Vietnam. Smells. As a child, I remember early that smells meant so many different things to me. Some good, some bad. I remember certain perfume smells so good to me and others were distasteful. The first bad smell I remember was going home on the school bus one day, and there was a lady in her front yard surrounded by firemen. She had been burning 
been burned bad, badly while burning leaves. This was the worst odor I'd ever smelled. I did not know it, but years later, this smell returned in Vietnam through napalm and other wartime casualties. It would linger in your nose for a long time. I remember the night I went down to the induction center in Charlotte, the night before I joined the Marine Corps. The old musky smell of the hotel room I was put in before being sworn in the next morning and leaving for Paris Island. I got up the next morning using an unfamiliar soap. That was unfamiliar that even today reminds me of the day I was sworn into the Marine Corps. I remember arriving at Paris Island in the middle of the night, stepping off the bus and smelling the early November air, very different than anything I'd ever smelled before, even at the beach. Being put into tight quarters with so many other people were smells I will never forget. I remember standing in formation so long that recruits would use the restroom on themselves because they were not allowed to go to the head. This was all part of the process and the smells. I remember the smell of spit shining shoes and heating polish and clearing my weapon, over, cleaning my weapon over and over again. I even remember the smell of graduation, putting on the new dry clean uniform and our new dress shoes and each item of clothes I put on that day enhanced by the excitement of graduation. I remember the huts we stayed in at Camp Geiger in the infantry training, the stoves that used fuel oil and the odor they gave off. Outside smells so much different there with all the firing ranges, guns fired and the smoke that resulted. I remember going to MOS school that was anti-tank weapons and firing the 106 Recallus rifle. I remember going to the course where we learned how to use the flamethrower. It took kerosene oil as we went on to use napalm and the distinct smell it gives. The smell of TNT charges going off. I remember graduating demolition school. The smell of depth cord is ignited from the blasting cap. The different smells of C4, the use of and smell of TNT when exploding is like no other. When I landed in California for survival training, the smell changed tremendously. The dry air while out in the field was completely different than that of anything that I had smelled before. The cooking of the small pygmy rattlers was new to me. Eating vegetation that we were taught to live off of had unique smells. On my way to Vietnam, we stopped in Okinawa to take shots and some guys got sick. This smell was unbearable at times. Stepping off the plane in 100 degree heat filled your nostrils up with negative smells, all different for this North Carolina man. When I learned in Vietnam and stepped, when I landed in Vietnam and stepped off the plane, I was not ready for the 120 degree heat. I was taken back by the smell of burning human waste. There came my first day in the bush, the smell of the jungle, the heat, the smell of grunts, and the same clothes for months. Then the smell of death of the enemy and our casualties was undeniable. Then I was medevac to Guam. It was a smell of <clears throat> a smell of Vietnam and the smells I had left behind with my family. When I arrived in the hospital, I was placed in a ward with many amputees. The wounds were not closed, so there were so many smells of the dying flesh. When the wounds were cleaned in the morning, the smells got stronger. It was very unpleasant, but better than the alternative of death for me. 
when I arrived back in the United States in Alaska, changing temperatures for about 80 degrees, when I finally got home, the smell of my family, my community, my home smelled just like it did the day I left. It was so good to be home. Today, I'm reminded of these smells in certain situations. The smells were part of the experience, making it more vivid and more distinguishable. The end. This time I would like to ask William Ramsey to read his piece. Hello, uh, my name is William Ramsey. I served with two different units in Vietnam. I served with the 1st Infantry Division for about oh, eight months and then I served with the 199th Light Infantry. In both situations, I ended up in an armored cavalry unit, which was kind of weird because I'd been trained as infantry. But that's what happened over there. Things just didn't always go the way you thought they were going to go. The piece I'm going to read is one called, I Did Not Know Your Name. After having seen so much happen to people, I took it upon myself to make sure that these people that I saw, I would never forget their name. And, I, and it's, it's taken me years to chase all of them down, but it has been an effort that I have found to be more than uh, beneficial to me. And okay, I did not know your name. I did not know your name as I watched the armored personnel carrier after having struck the landmine pirouette like a blue whale breaching the ocean surface. To this day, I see you hanging there in the hatch while your tether to life itself is being cut asunder, Bernard James Hendry. I did not know your names as I drive past the blast site, which is within sight of the gates of Lycay. You were at the end of a year's tour of duty in Vietnam. So close you were to seeing the faces of those you loved and those who loved you. You were like lost souls caught in a blizzard for days on end who finally get to safety only to be snatched away by the wolf of war as your hand makes contact with the doorknob. Added to that macabre twist of fate, all of you from the same town in New Hampshire, Guy Blanchett, Gaetan Bodine, Richard Ganest, Richard Raymond, and Robert Robichard. There are three body bags as well lying beside the road waiting to be picked up. They contain the remains of the unfortunate Vietnamese father mother and daughter killed as well. I will never know your names. Your sin was being beside your truck, this truck. I note the ruthlessness of warfare, which can befall the innocent. I did not know your names at the unexpected sound of an, of an explosion shaking the air inside a thund fire support base Thunder One. I sit in the mess tent, eating along with several others. We only give it a passing thought. Shortly, I will know the truth that death stalks you without pity once the hounds of war have been released. There is not an ounce of safety anywhere here. In a nightmarish turn of events, each step so simple and inane, but when put together, they produce a lethal result. My troops Captain John Howard Guthridge and Staff Sergeant Charles Joseph McDonald have both been lost. Fallen, of course, by that absurd mental gibberish of, oh, I guess it was just their time in an attempt to describe the undescribable. I did not know your name as my lieutenant walks back towards our APC with a shaken and ashen look on his face. On the right side of his forehead is a trickle of blood. He witnessed you take the brunt of a stupid actions made by a 16 year old nitwit sent into combat arms to quote, make him grow up. I guess his parents thought in signing their permission slip they would be relieved of the troublesome ways of an irresponsible teenager. 
yet you pay their butcher's bill with your life by getting caught in the blast of the grenade the kid himself was stupidly had stupidly supplied to the enemy. Robert Benoit. I did not know your name, but only hear of your passing via the headset I am wearing at the time. Your job is the same as mine, driver of an APC, and also the most vulnerable to immediate death from landmines. Having seen before the results of such an encounter, I can only hope it was an immediate departure with no suffering, Andrew B. Sexton. I did not know your name, but in witness to the plume of black smoke and sound of screeching shrapnel, only a fragment of you left to be placed on the dust off. That morning you had sat at the APC, on the APC, as the orders of the day were being outlined for your Arvin counterparts. The look on your face had a faraway appearance, and it still does today, when I gaze over photos of that time. Helping train the Arvin soldier was a high-risk venture, and you did so without regard for yourself, Captain David Edward Kaczynski. I did not know your name as I looked at what remained of the APC you had been driving. Once again, we shared a kinship of sorts in both being drivers. The stark reality before me leaves no doubts in my mind as to the consequences of missing any hint or a scent of immediate danger. I did not know your name, but in the intervening hours between seeing and hearing about your fate, we achieved a brotherhood and bond still holding strong today. You taught me to take nothing for granted and never, ever let my thoughts stray. If I wanted to stay alive, that is, Eugene Ray Jenkins. I did not know your name, but knew a young man who served with you. He had gone from being my track commander to what seemed like in a heroic role. Someone higher up had thought that the cavalry would be a good place to mimic a show on television called Rat Patrol in the jungles of Vietnam. What has happened instead? Despite your efforts and good leadership, the fragility of your transport and the quick ingenuity of the enemy has brought a swift end to an officer's Hollywood romances of glory. You bring reality home much too expensively, Lieutenant Burton K. Phillips. I did not know your names as I drive you back into the village square. Your cadavers are piled into a makeshift bin on the front of the tank, leaving you only a couple of feet from my face. Maybe the villagers know of you. You're their problem now. I did not know your names as I look over your bullet riddled bodies. I did not know the names of your possible husbands or lovers. Maybe there are children somewhere waiting for your return. A mother or father wondering what has become of their girl child. I did not know your names as you climb on board my track for an American-Vietnamese joint operation. I see a small, lampish people who seem to be somewhat lackadaisical about what awaits in the day ahead. I watch you march off with the same attitude, some with rifles over your shoulders carried like afterthoughts. Some stroll like school kids holding each other's hands I know that some of you will not see the day's end. I did not know your names, but I do remember your faces. I did not know all of your names as we split company on the eve of a fateful day. Voices and call signs will be the only tools of identification the next day as terror and desperation reign supreme around you. By its end, and in the following days, I will come to know of Eldon Moore, Daniel L. Flynn, Everett L. Ankrum, Edward E. Howard, William Bond, and J.W. King. Billy Joe Schaefer, I knew your name only too well. We were brothers in arms at the very first handshake. So what can be said of the named and unnamed? Simply this, with absolute certainty, 
whether friend or enemy, each embrace the desire to live and laugh with the same passion as any one of us living today. Also like us, each would ask of life to please remember my name. The end. Thank you, Pete, what a great story. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left, so I was going to see if maybe uh, John Hoffman had another story he'd like to read. Maybe Midge after that, and P uh, William Ramsey after that, if we have time. So uh, if you've got something else uh, close by that you'd like to read, if not, we can have a discussion. So, uh, John, do you have something you'd li else you'd like to read? Yeah, let's get off on mute there. Sorry. Um, sure, I can. I can. Uh, I can read. You know. You know. I have several others. Do you have one you would like me to read? You want me to do enduring, enduring image or one of those? All right. <clears throat> the title of this piece is uh, an enduring image. I wrote this uh, some time ago at the very beginning of our uh, brothers like these writing efforts. Um, upon graduating from Georgetown University in June of 1969, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. I reported to Ranger School the next day. After earning my Ranger tab, I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas, where I found myself detailed to the Military Police Corps. Fort Hood in those days was the most violent stateside community in the U.S. military. Nearly every soldier assigned there was returning from or departing for duty in South Vietnam. At Fort Hood, the original drug cartels preyed on young soldiers. Off-post criminal gangs exploited illegal liquor, gambling, and stolen military goods. Newsweek called it Fort Pothead. We averaged one homicide a week. Every confrontation had the potential for serious injury or death for our MPs. The prevailing political climate led to frequent and sometimes violent protests near the post. By early 1971, I had dealt with violent offenders almost daily. I had discharged my sidearm in the line of duty more often than most American law enforcement officers do in an entire career. Threats to my personal safety meant sleeping with my 45 nearby. I needed a change. The Army needed volunteers to fly helicopters more than it needed experienced MPs. I volunteered knowing I was trading the risks of duty at Fort Hood for the hazardous nature of combat helicopter pilots and assignment to South Vietnam. I'd grown up flying with my dad, an Air Force fighter pilot. Besides, the war in Vietnam was winding down. I figured that by the time I completed nine months of pilot training, it would probably all be over. Well, in December 1971, I stepped off a World Airways DC-8 jet into the heat, humidity, and noxious smelling air of Benoit Air Force Base near Saigon. Soon, I was flying CH-47 helicopters out of Marble Mountain Army Airfield near Da Nang. Every day, I flew over the crash site where my first cousin, George Dewey, died two years before flying a Marine CH-46. With the onset of the Easter Offensive in 1972, my Chinook unit was stood down. Our aircraft transferred to the South Vietnamese Air Force, and I was reassigned to fly slicks on combat assaults to support South Vietnamese allies fighting North Vietnamese regular army forces and their Russian advisors in I Corps of Vietnam. We were in the midst of the first large scale armored battle since the Korean War, often flying through flak so thick it seemed you could walk across it. The 51 Cal and 57 millimeter AAA fires and the occasional SAM-2 or SA-7 missile fire was so intense, we rarely landed without new ventilation in our aircraft. We found that if we left the doors off while flying in contact, there was less to repair after each mission. One of the few enduring positive images for many of us was the sight of the American flag as we popped up from flying through the treetops to make an approach into a U.S. fire support base along Highway 1 north of Hue, or after flying through the frequent coastal scud clouds returning from a combat mission, we could break out into the sunlight on final approach to our home base at Marble Mountain 
and see the flag flying above field headquarters. The American flag has always held special significance for our fighting soldiers. It's more than just a symbol to us. It represents who we are and at some level for all of us, why we do what we do. But most importantly, that we fight for each other. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's a great story. At this time, I'd ask uh, Midge Lawrence if she would read another piece, if she, she, if she would lie. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, the name of this one is I Didn't Know. I didn't know what a long and difficult journey Tom and I would be on when he was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, pulmonary fibrosis, and congestive heart failure. I didn't know how long we would be able to continue to go on our trips, visit friends and family, take drives to the ocean, and pop in at a great seafood restaurant for an impromptu dinner or lunch. I didn't know when Tom got his wheelchair that he would be hell on wheels. The very first day he had it, he got stuck in a cow pasture because he thought his wheelchair was a four-wheeler and cows were his favorite animal. I didn't know how devastating and debilitating this disease would become in the latter part, literally taking away his breath, making it so hard for him to function. He hid his pain well, so I wouldn't worry as much. I didn't know how kind, caring, and compassionate the VA hospice unit nurses and staff were and how much easier they made things for both of us. They treated him very special every day he was there. I didn't know what to expect when Tom's breathing slowed down. I held his hand. My son Tommy held my hand. My daughter Kim held Tommy's hand and she held her dad's hand. We were all connected together in a circle of life. We felt his heartbeat slow down, slower still, then stop. I didn't know how hard it would be coming home to an empty house that had his wheelchair, walkers, and personal items. I went into our room and looked at that king-sized bed and wept. I didn't know if I could ever be happy in my life again. How could I be? Tom was gone and I was all alone. I didn't know in the coming months how lonely I would become. But along with that loneliness, I started to gain some strength, courage, and self-esteem. I didn't know that I would have a wonderful group of friends called brothers and sisters like these to be there and support me as well as my family while I healed. I didn't know that I would become stronger and independent as I started alone down that long brick road on my own journey. The end. Thank you, Midge. Another beautiful story. Thank you so much. Um, Pete, do you have a short, a short story? And then I'll yeah, ask, I gotta, yeah, I'll yeah. ask, and then I'll ask Ron if, if he would, uh, tell people how they can help the vets through, uh, donations to the North Carolina Riding Alliance Foundation. So, uh, at this time, uh, go ahead, Pete. Okay. Um, the title of this one is both, I first titled it Interlude in Insanity, but I've since retitled it as The Banana Cat. <clears throat> it is a fairly quiet morning here in Tanland, almost bucolic in fact. Distant ridges to the north covered in triple canopy have spilled down their cooler air into the bottomland of a meandering stream interspersed with rice paddies. The resultant fog has begun to clear and the village is stirring about. I am here having just been assigned to a Sheridan tank. They are designed for battle on the plains of Eastern Europe against Soviet tanks. The manufacturer has specifically warned against deployment to humid climates due to all the weapon systems being electrically operated and subject to shorting out, it seems. Thus, it is the first place the Army sends them. They fail a lot, which gives us some of us a break from combat operations. 
It would be more pleasant to me, however, if we were not totally immobile with practically no perimeter and surrounded by stacks of artillery rounds in boxes as high as the tank itself. An open round, an open ground ammo dump. One mortar round or a satchel charge and oh well. Soon the kids will show up in the hope of making money off of the Americans coming and going near the runway. Normally, they want us to buy Vietnamese beer or rum or do errands for us, but the opportunities are slim. One kid seems to be excited about what he has to offer, and even though I am wary to let him near me with any suspicious object in hand, I do so anyway. The boy then surprises me with this little dark creature with a long hairy tail and enormous size for his overall size. But he is maybe a foot in total length. The little guy is not skittish at all and obviously nocturnal. He crawls right onto my hand and then up my arm and onto my shoulders and settles around my neck. The paws are like moistened spongy pads, cool in touch. The kid says he is a banana cat and asks, would I like to buy him? Now, you might be wondering why I'm even entertaining such a thought as having a pet, given the circumstances of the realities I exist in. Being in constant movement up to 16 hours a day, punctuated by moments of sheer insanity and desperation, what could I be thinking? But I guess that's just the point. The total <clears throat> absurdity of the life of a combat soldier is not lost on us. Every day we cope with the utter frailty of life and obscene manner in which it is flailed about. The gossamer thread we hold on to it by is much more akin to a spider's web than a ship's hawser. Absurdity has become a drinking partner. The little guy holds an incredible appeal. He is not aggressive and excludes calmness and tranquility. He allows himself to be stroked and handled. Already the frayed and raw nerves of my life are feeling some relief. A sense of kindness and her caring are taking hold inside of me. It never crosses my mind to put a name to him as he is as much feeling as being. Wow. Can they still exist alongside this coffee cask world I live in? Indeed, my fellow crew members are touched as well. Whatever difficulties keeping him might present will be dealt with. Predictions have become whimsical speculation at best. Later this evening and on successive evenings, he climbs the whip antenna on the tank and pulls guard duty with me never offering to leave, and after a few hours returns into my pocket. He is at peace in there, and my, snow, my, and my soul snuggles right there with him, mending from its tattered state. The end. Thank you so much, Pete. What a wonderful story. Uh, we're, we've started last week a writing class on Zoom and um, we're doing a lot of things to help vets and working a lot with the Blue Ridge Honor Flight. But uh, Ron Toller is getting ready to tell you about uh, how you can help veterans and heal from PTSD and mild TBI, which we're working now with Iraq, Afghan, uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, as well as Vietnam veterans. And we're mixing the groups, and it seems to work out really well in our classes. So this time I'll ask Ron Toler to take over and take the next uh, seven, ten minutes and just, just tell everyone how they can, can help vets that have suffered for years. Thank you, Ron. I'd like to uh, start by saying that I've had the opportunity to 
participate and listen in a lot of these classes. And I've recognized the effects, if you will, that war has had on our veterans. And I've seen the effects of this group and helping them heal. Uh, I'd like to read a story that I wrote after listening to a number of these stories from all the other veterans. And then I'll give you some more information. The title of the story is called Flak Jacket. And it was one of the original prompts that we had for our class. I, as I said, I wrote this one after having the opportunity to hear a number of stories from our fellow veterans. Flak jacket. The thing we wore to keep us safe, to protect the vital parts from incoming, to protect our bodies from rockets placed on Charlie Ridge and pointed toward the base. The thing we thought we left behind on that long flight to the world. But had we left it behind? Hadn't we really replaced it with an invisible shield of full body armor? Body armor that protected us from the slings and arrows of our fellow man. Body armor that held in the loss of youth, the anger, at times rage, the sorrow for what we had seen and done. We couldn't share that with our friends and families, so we trudged on with life. Some of us were lucky. The armor faded, developed cracks, and eventually fell away in big and little chunks. Helped by family and friends, it lost its usefulness. Some of us weren't as lucky. Still wearing that armor 40 to 50 years later, not having been able to let it go, not having been able to lighten the load. Some of us may carry that burden to our grave, but maybe some of us will get lucky and finally be able to drop that heavy load and step out into the sun to feel the warmth on our face, to have the load shared and lifted by those in a similar place, by those around us who care. What this group has done for a lot of us is replace the tribe that we were part of in Southeast Asia or in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And it has offered us the opportunity to share our thoughts and our stories with other veterans who have had similar experiences and thoughts. And our goal as brothers and sisters like these is to offer that opportunity to more brothers and sisters. A lot of the Vietnam veterans are transitioning, but there are a lot of Iraq, Afghanistan, Desert Storm, Desert Shield veterans that could benefit by the opportunity to share the stories that are in the back of their minds and 
what we would like to do is offer as many of them the opportunity that we can to carry that forward and to share their stories. Um, that's why the Brothers and Sisters Like These was formed and the public reading, whether it's in a Zoom forum or in a situation like the Asheville Community Theater or the Flat Rock Playhouse that we've read at before, all provide the veterans an opportunity to share their story with the public and for the public and their family and friends to have a better understanding of what they have gone through and what they are dealing with in their lives. As Steve said, we have started a new class. Uh, this week will be the second portion of it. We have been fortunate that one of our writers, uh, one of our class members has written the book on his experience in Vietnam and he's been willing to share his knowledge and abilities and lead the class. And he is ably assisted by a young Iraq veteran who has had three tours in Iraq and brings a great deal to the group with his writing and his enthusiasm and his caring. And we want to, as I said, continue to offer the opportunity to more and more veterans to be able to share their stories. With that in mind, uh, we established the nonprofit and we have established a website and we have a Facebook page. And if you are so inclined, uh, there's opportunities to make a donation to support our efforts on Facebook, on the website, or you can simply send a check to our post office box 18113 Asheville, North Carolina 28814. Everything that we collect goes to support um, the writing classes for veterans and to support the uh, continuation of the foundation. Nobody receives a salary. All of us that are involved are volunteers and 100% of your donation goes directly towards supporting the foundation and supporting the writing groups. We thank you very much for your interest and for listening to us on the website tonight, on the Zoom call tonight. And we look forward to being able to share more with you in the future. Steve, that's pretty much all I have. Like that. Uh, say, I appreciate John Hoffman and William Ramsey and, and Midge Lawrence and Alan Perkell and uh, Ron Toller for being here tonight. And, and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity that I, that I could read my story about smells. We, uh, we've really enjoyed uh, being with the Pack Memorial Library and we'll continue to do this as, as long as, as we can. So uh, we ask that everybody remain safe and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Have a good, have a good uh, rest of the week.
Bye-bye.